Okay, we'll call the meeting to order. It's 10.30. Uh, Ethan, if you please do a roll call for me. Jeff Swearingen. Patrick Updike. Present on the phone. Jeff Sunholm. Present. Marty Smith. Present. Tom Lampy. Present. John Benson. Bob Von Wolfrat. Denise <coughs> Pavlik. Present on the phone. Andy Buffington. Present. Ellen Hagen. Present. Deb Crable. Dave Ness. Here. Jason Leonard. Here. Rob Rotter. Here. Mike Casper. Carol Lund Smith. On the phone. Larry Smith. Present. Linda Fredrickson. Present on the phone. Kelly Grossgirth. Got 13, got a quorum. Thank you. <clears throat> to uh, introduction of board members, if we could start with those on the phone. Patrick. Patrick Updike, Iowa Department of Corrections. Denise Pavlik, Scott Emergency Communication Center, representing communication centers. Carol Lund-Smith, Iowa Law Enforcement Academy. Linda Fredrickson, Medic EMS, representing Emergency Medical Services. Perfect. Sheriff, you could start down near. Rob Ryder, Iowa County Sheriff, representing sheriffs. Marty Smith, Iowa Department of Public Health. Ellen Hagen, representing volunteer firefighters. Jeff Sundholm, Department of Transportation. Chris Myers, I'm the SWIC. Tom Lampy, DPS. Jason Leonard from the Waverly Police Department. Andy Buffington, Winnebago and Hancock County Emergency Management Communications, representing communication centers. Larry Smith, Kicka County Emergency Management. Dave Ness, to my place. Hey, welcome everybody. Uh, looking for the approval of today's agenda. Andy Buffington, so moved. Do have a motion for that? Do have a second? So moved. Yes. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, motion carries. Approval of the meeting minutes from February 8th. I'll entertain a motion for that. Larry Smith, so moves. Okay, do I have a second? Second. Second, Mr. Leonard. Further discussion? As somebody who wasn't here and read them this time thoroughly, love the hot link so I could watch Melvin. That's nice. Okay. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Hey, motion carries. Swick report. Thank you, Chair Lampy. Uh, start starting things off today. Uh, got an email from uh, OEC Director Dusty Rhodes uh, back in February. He was absolutely thrilled that they had a high number of last-minute SafeCom surveys, and I know many of them came from us. Uh, he was so happy that they extended the deadline of the SafeCom survey. You may have seen our Facebook post. Uh, it ex is uh, extended until March 12th, uh, so it ends next week. If you haven't submitted that yet, I highly encourage you to. Again, this will be a guidance uh, document for them going forward. It will delve into everything as far as decision-making, uh, grants, and everything else that is important to us. So if you haven't filled it out yet, I highly encourage you to do so. Uh, recently had a chance to go to a meeting and ride along with Worth County Sheriff's Office uh, to get us some insights on their interstate interoperability challenges uh, and other unique aspects that they have to contend with. Um, one thing I've kind of concluded is that these ride-alongs are very beneficial for me in actually getting the boots on the ground feel for uh, issues and concerns that are out there. And in the future, I'm going to try to uh, do one of these every quarter so that I uh, can kind of keep touch with what's actually going on out in the field and, and help with any decision-making processes that I'm involved with. So if you hear me reaching out with requests for a ride-along, don't be surprised in the future. 
Um, I'm also working on more outreach and meetings with county and local stakeholders. Uh, that's an ongoing project, as you're aware, and it will continue for the immediate foreseeable future. Uh, I'd like to update everybody, too, uh, on some of the COMT things we've been working on. Uh, Tracy Bearden from Polk County has offered to assist us with some of the uh, aspects of getting people credentialed and setting some exercises up within uh, also the training committee, and uh, Captain Walls will be helping out with that as well. So I want to thank her for that. It's an important thing that we're undertaking to try to get more credentialed COMLs and COMTs in the future. Uh, we'll dive into encryption now. Uh, the encryption subcommittee meeting met yesterday uh, at Cedar Rapids Central Fire, so thanks to Captain Walzer for helping us uh, get that meeting space. Uh, we covered things that may not sound all that interesting, like management of keys and keeping them secure in inventory disposal. But when it comes to making sure that encryption key stays secure, one of the easiest things to do to compromise it is to either mismanagement or let a radio get out into the wild uh, that still has all the encryption stuff and programming materials in it. So we covered on uh, aspects of making sure radios are wiped before they get marked for disposal, uh, how to securely transmit keys to those that need them, uh, defining who needs them and things like that. So uh, that way, uh, once we have that uh, set of requirements lined up, we can send that to the standard subcommittee for further moving up through the board and their processes. So we continue the progress towards uh, getting encrypted interoperability on ISIX. And uh, Jim Lundstedt mentioned last month also that we're not alone in this. I know several states that have previously said we will not encrypt anything on our statewide networks are now reconsidering that decision. Uh, closest to us is Kansas. In the past, they've been stark opponents of encryption, but now they're reconsidering it, and they're interested in what we're doing as well. Uh, so overall, the timeline for that, I'm still thinking that it's going to take at least 12 to 24 months to get all this ironed out because we have a whole bunch of things to figure out with regards to standards and policy, and then we have to test what we've developed to make sure it works before we roll it out in its entirety. Um, We'll touch on some subscriber unit testing as well. Uh, I've been getting in touch with Motorola recently to get some of the latest subscriber testing documentation. I know one concern that was voiced to me was if the testing procedures will change based on the firmware that the system is running. Most of the documentation we have is for versions that are three and four iterations old. So in case new standards or new features have been rolled up into the system or some bug fixes have been applied to previous versions, we're gonna to try to get the latest documentation to ensure that we can uh, get a good sense for what we need to test. And more or less, it's making sure that all our I's are dotted, T's are crossed, and making sure that our Q's do not look like O's with regards to that, because we wanna make sure everything works right out of the gate. Uh, as far as interstate uh, interoperability and transports go, uh, the RICs have their third meeting scheduled for that. This will be the big one where we start looking at things that are actually on paper as to how we could approach this going forward. Uh, with regards to the interstate aspect of it, uh, the neighboring SWICs have been invited to the next meetings as well, and uh, the interest from them has been very positive. I know they're all curious as to what we're going to do, and they want to help us out any way they can. Uh, so those will be happening over the next uh, month and a half or so. I want to thank everybody who has been participating in those meetings as well. They've been highly, highly productive, and I think it showcases the talent that we have lying within each region across the state, and it gives me a lot of hope that we can use the RICs for more things going forward. On the topic of RICs, uh, we, knew ha we have some new chairs for RIC 3 and 4 I want to report to everybody. Uh, Sergeant Corey Truckle from the Ida County Sheriff's Office uh, is going to be our new RIC 3 chair. Uh, I also want to thank Larry Hurst for agreeing to take the chair position for RIC 4. Uh, Luke Erpelding is also going to be a RIC 3 co-vice chair. And that follows a template that I'm starting to roll out for the rest of the RICs as well in expanding the leadership. Uh, one of the things that has given me some pause recently is, is, is things like distribution of workload, uh, how much of a time commitment we're actually asking versus what people are actually have to, having to put into it. And then also lines of succession in case someone is tied up with work requirements, uh, personal matters. You know, that way we have a more robust template in place for uh, things to get done even in someone's absence. Um, in the event where everybody's available, in theory, we could even run projects in parallel and, and increase the pr productivity of each RIC as well. And I think that's exciting to think about what we might be able to accomplish with that. Uh, some more uh, stuff to cover quickly. Uh, Chair Lampy and I will be headed to the uh, National Governors Association Conference in Albuquerque, uh, March 19th through the 21st, if I remember those dates properly. 
Uh, it's going to cover interoperability efforts in Iowa. Uh, Blake Derushi, our state 9-1 coordinator, is also going to go with us. And a representative from the governor's office is slated to come with us as well. Uh, this is something that at the SWIC level we fought pretty heavily for to make sure that the right people are at the table for interoperability and emergency communications. And uh, I'm excited to see how this turns out. Uh, one last thing, the next COMEX is slated for April 23rd and April 24th. I hope I have those dates right. Uh, it's going to cover a severe weather event that happened in 1998. Some of you may remember it when we had that big derecho roll through that caused a massive swath of destruction from northwestern Iowa all the way to the Quad Cities and south. So it's going to be a couple of day exercise. There's actually going to be several command posts set up that are geographically diverse in the sense that they're separated by, uh, in some cases, 100 miles or so. So it'll be interesting to see how all that plays out. That is uh, what I have for this month. And with that, I will take any questions. Okay. All right. Thank you. you Move on to the 911 Council, Blake DiRucci. Thank you. Good morning. The 911 Council approved two additional trainings today. Uh, one for Union County, which is a two-day course on uh, ethics and legal, as well as officer down. And the second course for Van Buren County, which is a gold line success training that we've approved a couple uh, uh, else, a couple other ones in the state. Uh, two things to bring to your attention. Last week, uh, the auditor re released its report on PSAP expenditures. If some of you are familiar uh, or uh, involved at the PSAPs at, at your county, uh, this is about the eight-page spreadsheet where you list all of your expenditures that go towards running the PSAP, not just 911 surcharge. Uh, so that's a, we ask for that data every year, but the audit comes out every two years. Uh, it's been remarkably similar over the lifetime of this, pro, uh, this report, which is four years now, so two audit reports, uh, that about 25% of PSAP expenses statewide uh, on an annual basis come from 911 surcharge. That means the, the rest comes from the local sheriff's fund, local general fund. Uh, the audit report uh, pointed out that there was no misspending of 911 funds, uh, and also kind of, uh, again, reiterated that uh, local PSAPs need to maintain their, their data a little bit better, show their work, if you will, when reporting their expenses uh, on the form. Uh, the other thing that's really interesting is you see the, the differences and in, in maybe the, the misreporting at the local level on this form. But in aggregate, statewide, there's actually a high level of confidence that the data that we're getting is correct. So it kind of offsets each other uh, when there is uh, mis, uh, misreporting of the expenditures. And you know a lot of that, and they point this out in the report, is just training, the continual turnover at, at the PSAP level. Uh, and, and who submits that form. So uh, that's something our office is, is always continuing to try to improve upon and, and work with PSAPs on getting the best data. We want the, the, an accurate picture of what it costs to operate a PSAP. It helps me with a, a couple of the federal reports that I have to submit. Uh, so we have a good idea of what it costs to run 911 uh, in the state of Iowa. So I wanted to make you aware of that and also um, make you aware of a, a rather spirited, at least for us, discussion that we had at the 911 council meeting regarding certain hospitals uh, falling under a, the definition of a political subdivision. And the reason that's important is because they may earn a vote on the local 911 service board. If they are deemed to be a political subdivision, as, they, as the uh, admin code defines, uh, basically, if they have a public election, they have their own taxing authority, they have a geographical area of, this, of region that they're responsible for, and a public safety entity, so if they provide ambulance service, there's some discussion and, and some desire uh, that have been brought to our level uh, that they should earn a vote on the local 911 service board. If you're interested in that discussion, get a, get a hold of me. Go back and watch the video from, from earlier today's meeting. Um, I'll bring you up to speed on that. If Just looking for opinions at this point, it's kind of hard to get your brain wrapped around a hospital as a pub, uh, political subdivision, but when you look at the various definitions, it's pretty darn close. Uh, so any questions? Yes, Blake, uh, this is Chris. Um, in the event a county has multiple hospitals, would each hospital in theory get a seat on each 911 board it, or would they elect a singular representative? It to really gets to the how the hospital was organized. 
um, if they're organized under Iowa Code 347, which gives them that their standalone taxing authority, um, gives them a, a vote on a general election ballot, not just you know names in a hat and, and drawn out or you know an actual standardized ballot and a vote. Um, that would be a standalone political entity. Um, so I'm not saying every hospital. Uh, the best I can figure out is about 25 hospitals. So about 25 counties may have to revise their bylaws and, and include uh, this as a voting member. Um, we, didn't, we tabled it. Um, there was a good discussion. There was a motion on the table uh, that died for lack of a second, uh, but want to keep the discussion going. So, and it's more of an uh, advice or recommendation from the council to our office and the AG's office to kind of get uh, you know, an official opinion or, or ruling on the, on the matter. I have, I have one question. Uh, a year ago, there was some discussion about there was a lot of, seemed to be a lot of unreserved, unobligated funds with local 9-1 boards. Is that still kind of a topic this year? So that's, that's a good point, and it got actually brought up in the 9-1-1 council meeting too. Um, that discussion specifically relates to the Department of Management budget forms that are submitted to our office. Right now, we're, our office is getting those in three or four or five a day. Um, so all the counties are in the process of approving those budgets. Um, I go then and, and compile all of that, aggregate it, look at all the statewide data, and I'll get you that answer. Um, I hope it's a much better. The form that I was talking about is actually separate. They don't show those un unassigned or reserved funds on the form that I was talking about with the auditor's report. But I'll definitely brief that back out when I roll up the data and let you know if we've improved on that. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on to the user group committee. Chair Buffy. Yeah, thank you. Uh, user group committee um, continues to work as uh, as Swick Myers reported. The RICs um, are starting to uh, to gain membership. Um, it's still a slow process um, in different areas of the state. Um, however, that. Uh, that continues to roll along very well. We'll have four applications that the, uh, um, the user group committee has um, recommended approval to the board. We also have one change, and that was an error of mine um, that we'll discuss um, in old business. Uh, during the user group committee meeting, we had uh, some discussion regarding um, the want um, of certain areas of the state to have a metro area interoperable talk group rather than just using the regional or statewide. Um, I think consensus at this point is the those areas that wish to have a talk group specific to uh, a metro area, um, we will consider those as they're presented to the user group committee. Once they're um, brought there, they'll be um, they'll be forwarded here to the board level um, to uh, essentially be approved um, for the creation of those of those talk groups. Um, I, I believe it's going to be a short amount of time until Central Iowa will have that in front of the user group committee. Um, one of the things that's become very apparent as well, um, we already have the first one, is that um, is some way of amending our um, our applications. You know, we have folks that uh, initially all they really wanted was access to the interoperable <coughs> statewide and regional talk groups. Um, things change in a short amount of time for some of these jurisdictions, and they're wanting to to expand that and use it um, for operability as well. Uh, so right now, what we're what we're faced with is we're just having them go back through the application process and and resubmit um, their documents and supporting documentation um, because as one entity representing uh, multiple public safety entities or political subdivisions, if you will, um, they uh, we want to make sure that we're doing it right. Um, and I don't know if there's going to be a better process, but anyway, we're just kind of underway of talking about that and trying to figure out specifically what that means. Adair Guthrie is is really the first um, going through the fray, and they uh, again they've resubmitted their matrix of users, their um, their memorandum of agreement, or yeah, memorandum of agreement, um, and uh, a different documentation like that, as well as um, documents from the municipalities. Um, that are going to be under uh, basically underlying signatories. So that's the end of my report. If there's any questions, okay, we'll move on. Uh, don't believe Chair Benson is here. Is there someone reporting for Ellen? Maybe. 
Mr. Benson? Tom, I'm on the line for finance. Okay, we'll, we'll try to, oh, I'm sorry, finance. I'm sorry, no wonder. <laughs> okay, Kelly, sorry, go ahead, finance is first, you're, you're correct. Well, I got on late, so you didn't know I was on there, so I apologize for that. Um, Annual appropriation, we'll start with that. We have a balance of $202,659. Fiscal year 2018, we have spent $77,772 thus far. And encouragingly, we have been informed that the fiscal year 2019 budget will include $115,661 for the ISIC board. <clears throat> and Regarding the sleep pee for February, we spent $34,428. And we, and I might get the wording incorrectly on this, but the sleep pee grant, we have been reappropriated for, to receive that in another round here. Um, through December, $229,030 from the feds. 57258 is the state share for a total of $286,288. And then after December, the full amount of this reappropriation does become $763,435, which of which the feds pay 80% and we'll pay 20% of that. So that's very good news that we got that reappropriated. I, I, is that the right wording, Tom? Yeah, it's basically we're rolling we're rolling out of the SLIG P1 into SLIG P2.0, which was just approved for our, and what you just described is a spot on for the numbers. Um, the first the first batch is from now until <clears throat> December, and then the, the rest comes after December for a total of a two-year grant uh, to continue our FirstNet initiative in Iowa for outreach at uh, funds half of the SWIC, as you know, all of Sean Wagner and Ethan and as well as any materials or anything we need to conduct the outreach for the first net initiative as we build this out in Iowa. So, yes, it is good news that so, we received very, this. Yes, very good news. And um, the Finance Committee did meet on Tuesday, and um, we're okay with the financials that we saw. Okay, I would like to introduce the new member, if he's Jim. I want to put you on the spot. You could stand up and uh, give a little of your background. Jim, I'm not going to mess up your last name, so you're going to have to say it yourself. Right, why don't you come on up front? Jim is our new uh, director of uh, the Finance Bureau in our Department of Public Safety. So yeah, so my name is Jim Wintmiller. I'm the new director for the Ministry of Service Division for Public Safety. I um, actually started 20 days ago, so came from corrections, uh, one of which worked for inspections and appeals, and now I'm over at DPS. And yeah, do you guys have any questions for me? So Jim replaces Nikki, basically what she helped Kelly with the finances because everything funnels, as you know, through the DPS for the payments of the bills and the grants. And uh, it's, we're very fortunate to have Jim uh, back in there to uh, keep things in order. Yeah, I guess I'd only clarify that the 115,000 for 19, that's not obviously finalized. That was the governor's recommendation. And so we're obviously waiting to see what legis legislature approves, hopefully here in the next coming month, so. Could you reiterate uh, that it used to be 154,650, and, and the reason why it's now 115? Well, there was. I, I, I know it was before your a, time, but yeah, it was before my time. Obviously, and my guess is obviously part of the deal. De de yeah, so, so we were deappropriated uh, a certain amount of money, and then that carried forward into this. We didn't. That, we didn't really get that money back. So far, the governor's uh, appropriation adjustments that she recommended in January did not have any adjustments to this particular appropriation. So it's what was in 18 was still recommended for the same amount in 19. So. All right. We'll wait and see, right? Yep. Okay. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. I'm the voice you heard yesterday. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now we'll try governance. Is there anybody uh, going to speak for Mr. Benson unless he's on the phone? If he's, assuming he's not on the phone, uh, governance did not meet uh, this month. There was no action to uh, discuss or consider. Okay, thank you, sir. Operations, uh, Deb, are you still on the phone? Or she was never? No, she she's not on the in? phone. She sent me her report to Chair okay. Lampy, so I can uh, pass that on to okay. you. Um, the letter to all the PSAPs was sent out uh, this past month, as well as the short survey. Uh, the questions included 
Uh, number one, does your PSAP provide radio dispatching of police, fire, and or EMS? Uh, question two was, if so, does your PSAP or communication center have access to the ESX platform? Uh, and then thirdly, how does your PSAP or communication center access the ISIX platform if you already do have access? Uh, any comments and answers to the above questions will be recorded and categorized. Those PSAPs uh, that indicate uh, a need for assistance for connectivity will be identified and a report of those responses will be shared in April's ISIX B meeting. Uh, the Ops Committee also discussed a question proposed from the UGC with the eventual uh, use of LEA going away. How uh, does the Operations Committee have any opinions regarding replacements of the type of local resource commonly used by legacy VHF users? Um, so that is what they discussed at their meeting uh, per an email from Chair Crable. Okay. Any questions for the Ops? Okay. Moving right along. Outreach Committee. We continue to pass along information that we receive, and uh, each month I've gotten somebody they'll email and say, add me to your list. So that's nice. So it's, it's growing. Uh, Ethan does a good job of pushing out information on the, on the Facebook and Twitter and blog, uh, to keep them current on the first net and the Essex, and uh, the help of Sean. So, uh, Sean, you might as well just come out and uh, we'll do your portion. All right, thank you. So this is going to be pretty fast. Uh, with SLIGB2 going on right now, we're just trying to work with the NTIA and the grant directors to make sure that we are tracking along with what their intentions were and are for the SLIGB2. So we're heavily working with FirstNet, uh, the NTIA grant director, as well as AT&T to make sure that we're all tracking. It's the, the language is quite, I'm going to call it nebulous. So when, when the grant directors, when we spend two hours on the phone trying to make sure that we're in alignment, we, I have submitted already a two page document kind of outlining uh, the next 12 months as far as what outreach intends to do to see and make sure that we do get sign off because there's verbiage that says as directed by FirstNet. So it was important for us to take the necessary steps to make sure that everything is in alignment. Along with that, uh, so we have APCO Nina. Uh, they were very gracious to give us a spot and help us uh, secure a booth at their conference March 19th and 20th. We've started, a, I'm gonna call it a technology transition meeting. Uh, we've had a few members from RIC2 who were, who wanted to stimulate how we were talking about technology between county IT, PSAPs, uh, all, the, all the players and public safety in IT. So we had our first meeting, it was very good. We talked about case studies in which we could share with other counties across the state, counties and city entities, whether it be apps that they're uh, looking at for public safety, data sharing, as we know, that's a big thing. And all of this is part of what the new Sleepy2 grant is looking at is technology transi transitioning as well as data sharing. So these were kind of the big uh, genesis for, for this meeting. The last part is uh, kind of as Andy alluded to with the UGC group, uh, the evolution of joining ISIX is, is constant. Uh, we will be putting out a big code update on the ISIX website in the next week. Uh, we are also looking at heavily reviewing how everybody connects and how they join because uh, we've seen everything from what you described to, okay, well, I, I have, I'm an EMA, I signed up our county, but who has authorization, who can make admin requests, who can do this, who can do that, who can join their own uh, talk groups, how expansive those talk groups are getting. Uh, there's just a lot of things that are changing. And of course, the website was made to accommodate a lot of flexibility, but we're getting into realms of 
that are very difficult to say which is the right swim lane is what I'm going to say. Because we, we want people to find a swim lane that works for them. But at the same time, because there's so much flexibility in it, sometimes it becomes difficult to make it easier for the UGC and Andy and his group of people to, to get the right message of what people are asking for or for them to change whatever there is to go from interop only to operability. So we're kind of looking at that as well. I know we had about a one or two hour uh, marker board meeting the other day with the radio admin and just talking about some of his experiences in this situation and how it's become so vastly changing and rapidly changing. So with that, any questions? Sean, you have an outreach event here again coming up. For well, right now I submitted that to uh, Natalie with the NTIA to see, to make sure that it, it fits and because of that falls under the as requested. So um, then I'll be forwarding that to Tim. I don't anticipate any issues, but I am taking measures to make sure I go through the grant process for approval. We would like to get another outreach meeting scheduled for April, uh, the end of April over in Council Bluffs area. Uh, and to address, we've been getting questions about, this, this question keeps coming up, why did we choose the locations we chose? And I thought I'd talked about it, but I wanted to reiterate. The locations were chosen by the vendors so that we had network capabilities to demonstrate both systems. So I know some people are very frustrated because some of the locations are not central to the region. The centrality or was never a part of it. It was to make sure that the network existed so that you could actually test and see how both networks work. Now, granted, ISIX is going to be hopefully fully online in July, so it wouldn't matter where we would go. But we're, we're, if everything gets approved, we're going to be holding all of our outreach presentations up through July anyway. So you'll see the evolution. AT&T also, they have their network out there, but it's constantly evolving and improving. And I think Kyle from AT&T is here today to talk about a little bit of their updates. But I want to make sure everyone understands, though, very clearly. We did not choose these locations. They were chosen by both of the vendors, AT&T, FirstNet, and Motorola ISTICS to make sure that we would get solid testing and they would get a solid idea of what the networks would provide. Sean, I want to back up for just a minute. One of the one of the things you touched on as far as the application process, some of the hurdles that we're going to have to overcome is the idea that um, you mentioned emergency management being an applicant. Um, emergency management um, by Iowa Code 29C is established um, as representing all the governmental bodies um, within the county. So as those commissions um, vote to um, move forward with uh, with application to ISIX, there's an assumption that there's already, there's an implied consent from um, all of the political subdivisions within the county, as well as the 911 service boards. Um, they have representation from any political subdivision that does have control over a, um, a public safety entity. So as they apply as well, um, we're, we're trying to make this as seamless and easy as possible. Um, and I think we need to do a little bit deeper dig in and what are we going to allow? You know, do, as, as Adair Guthrie had to do, they went back to each one of the cities and had that governmental body essentially, um, I don't know, pass a resolution for, for lack of better terms on having to say, yes, we're gonna go ahead um, and we, we consent for Adair Guthrie EMA to, to do this. So I think we need to have a deeper discussion about how to streamline that um, to make sure that we don't make it too cumbersome um, and that's, that's aside from any type of amendment um, to the original application. But the reality is, is that 911 service boards and emergency management commissions already have representation from all those different political subdivisions. Right. The difficult part becomes when a, a sheriff or a fire chief submits and they want to make a change and the EMA was not necessarily notified. And that's where the the sidestepping and the cross-stepping become difficult because then, okay, well, the if the EMA doesn't know and he's submitting or she's submitting 100 radios and the sheriff also submitted another 100 radios 
And then of course our capacity planning, our administration planning and all of that becomes a, a nightmare and your, your committee suffers, so. Thank, and thankfully again, between Swick Myers, you and, and Ethan are keeping it, trying to keep it as straight as they can for me, but it can be confusing at times um, for each jurisdiction, especially if you have an agency applicant that might, that somebody might have already assumed is a sub app um, of, a, of a larger body. So thanks for the good work. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, thank you. Okay, we'll move on to training. Denise, or I'm sorry. Yeah, Denise, are you still on the phone? I still am. Okay, go ahead. Uh, so the training committee, we had changed uh, our meetings to every fourth Wednesday. They were every third Wednesday. So this month we met via conference call on February 28th. Uh, we discussed a uh, training that we had already had, which was a gateway train, the trainer class that took place in January, the week of the 21st. There were supposed to be three sessions across the entire state, west, central, and east. Um, we were able to uh, have a very successful class in the west portion and central portion. The east portion, due to uh, no enrollment, uh, they had to cancel that last day. Outside of that, everyone um, has given very good feedback on the Gateway Train the Trainer class. Uh, the trainers did an excellent job, and I've heard really good things about it. I wasn't actually in attendance, but I've heard really good things about it. So we were excited about that. The second class uh, course that we had was a COM-T course. Uh, they did have 10 students. The class went very well. And because there was a, a little bit of a lower enrollment in the class, they were able to get a little more hands-on time, which was very beneficial for the students. So that went very well. Uh, and um, Swick, Chris Myers actually already talked about the upcoming event in April of the 23rd and the 24th. If anyone is interested, I'm just going to... Uh, say that you can contact uh, Rob Hedgepath. They are looking for participants if you're interested in doing that. And I believe that the areas that they're going to um, host in, I think, are Cedar Johnson and Polk Counties. Um, I could be wrong, but I, I think that's what we had talked about. Uh, Swick Myers also talked about Tracy Bearden uh, and how she is looking to get ComTs uh, a venue so that they can uh, get all of their task books signed off and be credentialed for the state. So we thought that was uh, very good. The next thing we talked about was uh, train the trainer. We were looking for a Com L train the trainer class. We had applied for the OEC and obviously we're still waiting on all of those requests based on what they do with the budget and everything at the state level. However, or at the federal level, however, um, what they were talking about Jim Lundstedt, and if he's there, he can talk a little bit more about it, I'm sure, is maybe doing a regional train the trainer com L class that we would most likely or have a better opportunity to be able to get that TA request. Um, what that would entail is each state regionally would get two seats per state to put one of their people in there to be trained, you know, to be trained as a trainer. And then if we were to host it in Iowa as a regional class, we did talk to Jim. If the seats were not all filled by the other states, then Iowa would have, so to speak, first dibs to put additional uh, trainers in there if we wanted to do that. The next thing we talked about was the uh, end user training standard that did come back to us. It wasn't approved at the governance committee. They had some language that they wanted discussed. We did discuss it at the training committee level. We did table it based upon a few other items that were in there. And we're going to work on it a little bit further at the next meeting. We also talked about, as a part of that end user training standard, how were we going to talk about how we're going to roll out the training, who's going to create the curriculum, how is it going to be implemented, how is it going to be maintained, and all of those questions. So from the training committee, we thought that we really needed to talk with Chair Lampy with regard to potentially getting someone to assist us and, and help with all of those items, mm. developing the curriculum, moving forward with that. So it just so happens that Chair Lampy is um, one, one step ahead of the game. So when we did speak to him, Chris and I 
uh, spoke with Chair Lampy, who already had a proposal for consultation and training services. And uh, that proposal is currently with DAS. Um, and it is to help develop a training curriculum and then assist with the rolling out of the training and implementation, how we're going to, how all of that is going to be accomplished. Um, because it is with DAS, it will need to go to RFP. And I'm sure Chair Lampy, if you want to uh, pipe in, you can probably talk a little bit more about it. But uh, Chair Lampy did ask the training committee if they could um, potentially be a part of the selection process once all the proposals were received. Outside of that, that's my training report, and I'm sure if Chair Lampy wants to add more to that last item, that would be great. Sure. Uh, anytime we have over a certain amount, we have to follow DAS rules uh, with the state, so we can't just pick somebody to just go do our training for us. So I had one, uh, one company that uh, did just that, proposed something for us, so I immediately shipped it to Jim, who's our new director, and he then uh, got the process rolling and, and put it into the DAS process to get a uh, person assigned to it. So it will have to go to RFP. Uh, and then once it's out on the street on RFP, people will, uh, companies will bid on that, on what we ask for specifically. We'll have to ask, we'll have to write the RFP on what we want, what do we need, what are we trying to accomplish here, and they'll respond accordingly and we'll go through that process. So I would anticipate the operations committee and maybe the uh, technical committee or any other committee get involved with that process of scoring the responses and selecting uh, a vendor to to conduct our regional training in all six regions. And I don't know if you touched on it or not, but th this is a crucial tipping point for us. We have to, with the regional training in each region, which we would invite, I mean, e each, each region typically has, you know, 12 to 14 to 15 counties in it. So if we do it by the region, we invite all the counties and all the PSAPs uh, that it's imperative that you come to this training to learn how to use the ISIX interoperability system, how to use the regional talk groups, what they're for, how to use the tactical ones, how to use the statewide ones, uh, and all that. And, and, and by the way, the policy for those regional talk groups and statewide talk groups are already hopefully will be done by that time. So everybody has guidance and with policy and protocol that the board has introduced and passed as how those are to be used in what scenarios they are to be used. So it needs to be a nice, nice package. I think uh, with Terry's group, with the user group committee, we have to make sure that we put on the, on the top priority since we are hopefully going to start this process of this regional concept of training on the system that we get that particular policy to the forefront so we get that passed on the protocols and, the, and, and how to use that um, passed by this board on how to use those and when they're to be used. And uh, it's our duty to do that, uh, to get that established as fast as we can. You don't want to go do training without any, any standards. Um, so I think that's in the queue. Um, if we can find a best practice from other state, that's even better. We don't have to start from scratch. Uh, so yeah, that's, uh, I think, is a good step forward. It's a tipping point for us because uh, this thing is coming fast, faster probably than we thought. Uh, so by September of 18, uh, there's going to be a lot of uh, a lot of stuff going on and uh, for the good in the state. So uh, we got to be prepared for that as a board to set those standards for that time period. Is there anything else? Denise? I don't have anything else, Sir Lampy. Okay. Unless I, anybody I has have. I have one thing quick regarding the COMEX thing that slipped my mind initially. So thank you, Denise, for bringing it back up. Um, one thing I'm looking to do is test out some National Weather Service talk groups, or at least the concept of that during a widespread severe weather event. Uh, there may be a, a good pathway to utilize ISIX as a means for, say, emergency managers to send storm reports to the National Weather Service. And in theory, they would have a trinity of sorts of communications with the National Weather Service. Uh, they would have their NWS chat program that has been established for many years that utilizes the Internet. Of course, the old uh, good old-fashioned phone system. And then a, a, a robust statewide LMR network uh, certainly has been appealing to the Weather Service uh, personnel I've talked to recently. So I'm going to look at trying to incorporate that into the next COMEX as well. So if uh, any uh, people want to test that out uh, within the coverage footprint of ISICS, please let me know. Uh, we'll try to get something squared away. Thank you. Okay, moving on. Chair Updike, are you still on the phone? Yes, I am. Are the, you? Uh, technology. 
Go ahead. You have the floor. Okay. The Technology Committee met on February 22 and March 6th. I'll just kind of put all of these things together. We're we're still working on the subscriber unit test procedures, and and uh, Swick Myers kind of alluded to some of that. So. As far as that goes, that's one of our top priorities right now. We're still in the information gathering stage on that on that issue. So as as we move forward, we'll be able to get you more information. So I'm going to keep that subject short. <coughs> um, the uh, 800 scene of action channel update. Um, as you remember, we were going to license three frequencies in the 853 megahertz region. The license was um, somewhat denied, if you will, and we were issued frequencies in the 808 megahertz region, which would be, these are considered frequency pairs, so this would be the input frequency. Well, we want the output frequency, and we can't get it right now. We will probably have to go through another licensing stage unless we can get the current license amended. And the way we could possibly do that is is to revisit our 800 RPC plans. Uh, we've got some members within the technology committee who are going to do that. The 800 RPC, I think, meets in April of this year. Um, I did reach out to Minnesota. I did talk to Jim. <clears throat> He's with the 700 RPC. He referred me to Tim Lee. I, I never did get a response from Tim yet, but the, the, big, the big issue appears to be that we don't have anything within our 800 RPC plan for the state of Iowa that would allow us to use those frequencies. So if we can get that figured out with the RPC within Iowa and convince the FCC that we can, you know, we need these channels, then I think as we move forward, we can amend that license to add those frequencies. Um, next is the 700 meg air to ground channels. Um, we've kind of been through the process there of gathering all the information that we need on those channels. Um, I think I, I've decided that what I would like to do is just maintain what I've done in the past, bring this issue to the board next month to vote on, because that's how we've handled everything in the past, is to get board approval that way. Getting things like this licensed is somewhat memorialized, and, and you know it, it stays within keeping with what we've done in the past. The last subject is the programming guide. And, you know, we, we uh, passed this issue last month. I don't want to let this sit and do nothing. And so this this has been brought up in in the technology committee. Um, we we want to see this thing get populated, probably sooner than later. And that's probably more me than anyone else saying that. But I did reach out to uh, to Motorola to see how we could possibly get the information imported into that document through whatever means and and also populate some of that information onto that programming guide ourselves. And so we're working on that. We want that document in our hands, if you will, and have it stored at a secure location with DPS. And the only other thing that relates that to the ICS 217A form that we have on the website is, is that we plan on keeping the ICS 217A form separate from the programming guide, and the reason for that is is because of the confidentiality issues. Those frequencies that exist on that ICS 217A form are interoperability, basically interoperability channels. The board approved those that listing years ago when when Jim Bogner was slick, and so. What we're trying to do is keep that separate from the programming guide and get the general uh, user out there in the field to start programming these these frequencies, these conventional channels into their systems or radio subscriber units as they move forward. Because there's been some topic or uh, discussion with some of our members about, you know, how are we going to get people to do this? You know, use these channels to enhance the overall ISIC system and have those capabilities in the event that they, they need specific frequencies. So as an end, an end to all of that, I'm going to try to reach out to our uh, 
outreach and or training committees to see what we can do to get this information out there and and uh, you know get people on board that you know yeah we have an ethics system and yes it's going to do all these things but we we'd really like to see you add these as much as you can to your your overall fleet mapping so that you know it's there and and you're following the interoperability side of it if you will so that's all I have for this month if you have any questions Patrick, this is Larry Smith. I've got a question here. On your programming guide uh, process and also your approved radio listing, you got any idea how soon that'll be available? Because, for instance, for myself, I'm purchasing or looking to purchase radios, and I'm kind of wanting to, on, on the bubble here, you know, and to make it fair with these vendors, uh, there's a lot of agencies out there, I feel, that are getting ready to to either buy yet this fiscal year or next year, that they need some guidance on what to be buying in all fairness to the vendors. Yesterday would have been fine with me, but we know that that problem exists and that's why we're trying to move on this as quickly as we can. We understand that uh, if we can't get some of that information populated because the the vendor is busy trying to focus on building out the system. We are trying to input some of this information uh, manually. The only thing is, the only thing that comes up as a concern is, is how this document will be handled since it's, you know, a confidential document. Does that user have to be an approved user of the ISIC system before that information is handed out? And I think that's something to consider. Yeah, so are the, are the vendors going to have to go through a vetting process to, to be able to to do programming? You know, I, I think we need to get this sorted out real soon as well. Well, I think, and maybe Chris Myers would like to jump in here, but I think uh, we do have some of the system information that can be populated <clears throat> into that. Yeah, uh, Patrick. Uh, and actually, we have had some vendors program radios up for other entities that we already know are legitimate vendors and all that stuff. Um, I think what you're kind of getting at is how do we want to vet other people in the future that say, well, I can program a radio. So we just want to make sure that not any Joe Jack or Shirley can go and do that. So uh, we can start looking at a process for that. Obviously, we have several established vendors within Iowa that more than uh, are more than adequately equipped to do that type of work. And uh, we know that they can be trusted with that information and keep it confidential uh, based on their previous clientele. So uh, that's something we can look at going forward as well for some smaller shops um, that may not be on our radar per se. As far as the subscriber stuff goes, my hope is that we can have something lined up within the next month or so as far as, uh, you know, things that we're going to have to address based on the Astros version that we'll be running on and the TDMA to FDMA argument. Um, there's plenty of documentation out there for FDMA subscribers. And if we see that, well, for the most part, you know, features A, B, and C are the same, whether you're in an FDMA or TDMA environment, you know, it doesn't matter. But there's this one feature here that we want to have across the board that may vary a little bit depending on TDMA, then that's something we need to look at. I'm not expecting any tremendous problems with that at this point, but uh, then again, uh, that's not to say that those problems don't exist. More or less, we want to make sure that no one ends up purchasing equipment that doesn't work. Uh, I, I think that's that's the end game here. Um, or, and or purchasing stuff that they don't really need. Yes, that too. Oh. Um, anecdotally, the stuff I've had a chance to see tested so far has been very reassuring. So when I have more, I can uh, work with Patrick and we can report back on that. Okay, appreciate everybody's efforts. Okay, we'll move on to other reports, information sharing, uh, anything on board member level we'd like to discuss amongst ourselves here? Somebody's grabbing a mic, I can see that. Okay, go ahead. Uh, just to give a little situational awareness, IDPH, I have a Department of Public Health, is going to be doing a um, full-scale um, mass casualty exercise on June 23rd in uh, at the Abate Freedom Park in Algona. We'll be working with the uh, Kasuth County Emergency Management 
the region, I believe the region two emergency managers are participating. The healthcare coalition service area two will be participating. We'll be bringing in um, other state response teams, IDPH's public health response teams will be there. Um, it'll be a large exercise. We're excited to be able to do it again. We didn't one last year as well. And we'll be uh, looking for some support from uh, maybe an STR trailer, and I'll fill out the proper paperwork to do that. What's that going to be? It's uh, Algona. That's the oh. Abate uh, Freedom Park. So it'll be right before they have their uh, rally. So um, we think it's going to be a great thing. Go ahead, sir. Yes, Marty, this is Chris. Um, will there be an opportunity there for potential Com T or Com L? Uh, candidates to get their task books uh, filled out at that event? Yeah, it'll be interesting. Um, we're, uh, there's going to be uh, a bunch of different radios from different radio systems there. So I think that would be perfectly acceptable if there is somebody that uh, wants to do that, especially if there's a STR there. We tried working, uh, getting maybe one of the Air Guards MIOX up there, and we're still kind of maybe working that piece. And they have some other obligations, though. Anything else? I have one thing. Uh, the other day I, pre I presented at the Iowa Communications Alliance annual conference over at the Wells Fargo, um, along with uh, AT&T. And it went well. We were there at about a little over an hour with a lot of good questions. Um, so we updated the, the uh, first net initiative in Iowa, kind of went through from start to finish to where it is as of today. And I'm sure Kai will give us a little bit more here today on that. Um, the other thing I wanted to quick talk about is, are we still okay with, we do, we do this pretty much every year, every other year. We take a look at our board meetings and when we meet. Is everybody still okay with their schedules that we meet on the second Thursday of every month? Uh, there has been some concern expressed about that interferes with other meetings. We used to do them on Wednesdays, as you know. Uh, is it still okay? That, are we still good with that? I know it affects the 911 council, so I don't <clears> want to do a whole lot of <laughs> change if we don't need to, but uh, is everybody's schedules allow them to continue? And we've been doing really well with the quorums, so I just want to make sure that we're still intact. All right. Hey, we'll move on. Uh, Melvin, are you on the phone today? Uh, yeah, yes, I am. Okay, so Melvin will give the, his report over the phone on the uh, system update. Go ahead, Melvin. Very good. Uh, I was planning on being there in person, but uh, I was recalled back to Chicago, so um, this will be relatively quick. Um, last time we had met, uh, I indicated we had... Um, um, Pretty much every site in the system is either was either done or in process of being built. Um, so what we had pending were the three Iowa public television sites and then the five lease sites um, that we didn't want to start because we wanted to make sure everything else was was good. Um, so <clears throat> as far as the IPTV sites, I think the uh, the issues have been resolved. Uh, we visited uh, all the tower sites to do a uh, uh, not only a loading analysis but a visual uh, inspection of the sites as well. And um, uh, from our um, uh, from our uh, A and E partners, architect and engineering partners, only one of the three towers has to be reinforced, which is which is great. Uh, we received paperwork uh, from IPTV and from the state. Um, I think it was yesterday, so uh, our attorney is reviewing it, and it just has to do with liability, um, which means that uh, all the other agreements are pretty much in place. So once this is uh, signed, uh, we can kickstart and start uh, working, uh, putting the IPTV towers on a schedule to start building. Um, in addition, we had two sites that were in regulatory. Um, one of them is falling out. Um, we have an issue with, uh, we have tribal issues on it. 
So we've been looking at uh, two alternative sites, uh, a lease and a county site. Um, so we're in the process of, of trying to resolve that one. Um, but we do have those two identified. So either one, um, you know, uh, they, they, one has advantages over the other, so we're assessing that right now. Um, but we can certainly move that, uh, I believe, that uh, by the time we meet next time, um, that one is going to uh, fall out of the regulatory because we're going to pick uh, one of the alternative sites. So with that said, that leaves only one site in regulatory, which so far we have seen no reason why it's going to fail. The, the lease sites, um, uh, again, uh, we wanted to wait. So this, uh, this one site that I just mentioned that uh, has uh, tribal issues, one of the candidate sites is a lease site. So as long as uh, as long as the um, uh, we can proceed with that, then all the other sites are pretty much locked, and um, uh, the uh, the the lease paperwork is actually um, we provided that uh, to the state, and they're looking at it. Um, so again, just like with IPTV, we are ready to start with the lease sites as well. And uh, with all the lease sites, again with the five. Uh, potentially six, uh, only one of the sites requires uh, tower reinforcements, which means that we can resolve uh, build those sites relatively quickly. Other than that, um, the, the build continues. Uh, we're moving from site to site with the microwave connections. There's definitely a lot of activity. Uh, the last two weeks were uh, tricky uh, because we had high winds and snow and that kind of uh, push some of the basic stuff that we were doing. Uh, we had to push that out. But other than that, um, actually, we seem to be in pretty good shape. I was planning uh, on this meeting uh, to uh, talk about um, coverage, so I'll be, I'll take the equipment with me uh, next time, uh, which I'll be able to show you what the equipment looks like when we start doing our coverage testing. And I want to be able also to show what the distribution in terms of um, how we're going to manage uh, coverage uh, and how we're going to group the, the regions and whatnot. Other than that, we seem to be in pretty good shape. Melvin, do you, how many sites are in site trunking right now? We have enabled... Um, we we have a team of SDs, um, and we have about 20 sites uh, that are uh, on the progression because these 20 sites, which go from Des Moines all the way out to the to Region 6, um, that we're in the process of optimizing those sites so that when we um, connect them, uh, we can light up from the middle to the eastern side of the state relatively quickly. Uh, that puts us about 20. Um, we, what we've been doing is sometimes we, depending on the nature of the site, after we optimize it, we disable it so that it's not in site trunking. Because uh, sometimes, again, since we're still building and optimizing, keeping it up in site trunking can complicate things. So um, it's not a clear answer, but we have about 20 sites that that are ready for, for site trunking. Some of them are on and some of them are not. And the, in addition, we have sites uh, on, on the western side of the state, uh, Region 4, um, four sites to be exact. Um, and uh, those, those sites are going to be in wide area trunking uh, uh, by next week, I believe. Um, you know, so it's uh, as long as weather cooperates, um, you know, we'll have quite a few sites uh, being powered up. Our biggest headache has been, uh, again, power to the sites. Some of these have taken quite a while to get the, uh, the utility company and the paperwork associated to get the powers uh, uh, trenched to the site and, and enabled, which is why we've uh, slowed down on some of the sites because we don't have power. Okay, any questions from Melvin? Yeah, I have one, uh, Chair Lampy. Uh, actually, two. Melvin, uh, I'm assuming the site that is still in regulatory at this point that you said there's no reason for it to fail, is that the Hooper site in Warren County? Correct. 
Okay, thank you. And then secondly, too, um, just so I think I have this understood properly, when you say wide area trunking, in that sense, you mean that the sites are microwaved together, but they don't have a connection to the core yet. Is that correct? No, what that means is that when you talk about wide area, that means that those sites will be connected to a core. Okay. All right. Thank you. Site trunking is a site that's, that's isolated from the core. Okay. Thank you. Okay. We'll move on to our first presentation from FirstNet. Come on up to the podium. You knew you had to do that, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I've asked uh, AT&T if they could uh, every month to give us some type of update, as Melvin does, on the progress of, uh, of the FirstNet build-out in oh. Iowa. So, Kyle, you have it. Yeah, I brought a presentation of just a few slides to, sure. to help, this, help us with this. Out. <coughs> <clears throat> Not sure if you can all see that. Yep. Okay. Outstanding. So, uh, my name is Kyle Spees. I'm with AT and T FirstNet team. Uh, obviously, my role is is the outreach and consultation within the state of Iowa uh, to assist with any any type of of FirstNet discussions, um, signing on, getting subscribers, um, discussing the FirstNet solution in a whole with 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 all agencies within the state of Iowa. So, my background includes the last five years of five years of working with public safety agencies and. And um, the last 10 years in technology sales as a whole within uh, wireless industries. So uh, today I want to give you kind of a little bit of a, of a refresher of some of the, the main aspects of, of what FirstNet entails and then also some of the new items that are coming out just this month uh, within March to give you kind of an update of, of where we're at. Uh, so, so six key facts of, of what makes FirstNet different than uh, what you have with any other cellular carrier today, including AT&T. Uh, it's highly reliable network coverage. This is covering 99% of the population once it's fully built out. <clears throat> that also includes a 98% geography number in Iowa. Um, so there's been a lot of questions about that, of it, if it's being built out to just population instead of geography, that is not the case. So we're actually looking at enhancing the rural coverage within the state as well, and those sites are being built out. It's a five-year build plan when it comes to, to Band 14, but I'm not sure if anybody has seen recently um, from our own Chris Sandbar, who's been doing a lot of um, interviews and putting out information about what the, what the build plan looks like, um, is that we're actually much, much further ahead of time and we'll have band 14 sites available in Iowa this year. Uh, number two is, is priority. Um, so when you take a look at priority coverage, I'm sh sure some of you are familiar with uh, wireless priority service or the get service that gets you uh, to the front of the line on a, on a cellular coverage or on a landline coverage. Um, what priority does uh, in this case is we also are able to give you quality of service within cellular connections, but it also, uh, the second part, portion of that is giving you uh, preemption on the line. So primary users, police, fire, EMS, and we'll talk about primary versus extended primary a little later, will actually be able to make sure that their data signals, uh, cell signals, text signals are all going through the network, and that if there is a disaster or congestion on our wireless networks, that other users are preempted off of that. Uh, so that what that means is if it's a normal business consumer or something like that, their their usage has taken down and preempted off of those channels, so public safety traffic can go through and make sure that that the traffic that you're sending is working at all times. <clears throat> Uh, trusted security and resiliency. Um, so to, to talk about that is we're actually coming out with a, with a brand new core, which I'll go into here in a few slides, to make sure that you have full end-to-end -end, uh, encryption of all of your data activities, calls, and text messages, anything that you'd be sending over the cellular network. We have a public safety application store um, and also some events that are coming out to, to, uh, to help with this. We're having some hackathons, um, some other items that we're looking for developers to come in with more public safety applications for you uh, to be able to test those. And so the application store isn't necessarily replacing an iTunes application store or Android application store. It's, it's an actual website that you would be able to go to 
push applications out <clears throat> to your users and they would be reviewed by public safety personnel. Uh, we have a dedicated support team, 24-7, 365, that is all FirstNet trained. So they are trained on the, de the devices, equipment that you would use that would be specialized compared to other departments. It's not a normal call center um, where they're used to dealing with consumers and business all day. It is specifically trained in public safety applications, including equipment. And affordable plans with advanced features. Um, so with, with that, I mean, we're happy to give anybody a quote at any time to discuss what the, what the plans, the costs are of, of a monthly agreement. The state of Iowa in whole actually has a discounted agreement compared to what you would normally see from what we would like to call list price. Uh, so list price is what's out there, is what you see in a per unit, per smartphone, per data line uh, cost. The state of Iowa has a, a, an actually uh, agreement that gives you lower pricing as well. So all 50 states adopted in within the end of December. This is important because we wanted to look at from a state plan perspective, but also from a national plan perspective. So since every state has opted in and is going forward, moving with FirstNet as being the public safety network across the nation, this allows us to go through and, uh, and launch our, our new FirstNet core. So essentially what the core is, is the brains behind your cellular network. The reason why we want a new core is because our, our current core is, is designed just like every other wireless carrier's core to be a consumer network. This needs to be advanced core to support public safety traffic. This is coming out within the next few weeks. Um, so it's designed to public safety specifications to make sure that the standards of what the first responder network authority is, is giving us is, is how this traffic is ran. Uh, it's built on physically separate hardware um, so that makes sure that, as I stated, it's completely separate from our normal uh, consumer and commercial traffic. It's encrypted from end to end. Um, so this allows you from, depending on what type of VPN solutions that you use, it could be net motion or anything like that, it keep, this keeps your traffic encrypted even when it's running through a cellular network. Um, so you can be sure that as it's running through, uh, that nobody is being able to see that type of traffic, what you're running, what type of reports you're sending at, at any point in time. It's monitored 24-7, 365. So we have a dedicated security operations center team that, it's, that is monitoring this core, monitoring the traffic to make sure that the public safety traffic continues to run separately uh, from anything else within the AT&T network. A heightened capability. So the, the biggest example and the biggest reason of why we're looking at a new core is, is giving you multiple priority levels. Uh, so right now, if, if your agency signs up, you have the priority and preemption that we talked about. Uh, everybody gets that. That's a, that's a public safety. With this, you'd be able to design your agency's priority levels. So if you have uh, a, you know, a chief of police, to, you know, disaster recovery, EMA, whomever needs to have those highest priorities when a, when a disaster happens or an event happens, they would have higher priority levels within there. And that's all managed through local control. So each agency is able to manage those priority levels within their area. How's that done? Uh, it's done straight through the website. So if, you, if, you're, if you're familiar with local control, you can, kind of, you can actually design just from, uh, to give me an example, you can see your, all your normal stuff, your billing, your users, everything like that. But you can actually, uh, a portion of that, put in your different priority levels that is registered by phone number. <clears throat> So to give you an example for your agency, if you would want yourself as the highest priority, your phone number would go first, and then you list them out. This can help with running traffic to make sure that if you need certain, uh, certain members to have preemption or authority first and to get calls out in a congested area, uh, those are able to go through. Thank you for the question. Any other questions on that before I move on? Now, will that be from just eight, from uh, AT&T to a and T and T person or a T and T to others. How's yeah. that going to work? Are yeah. you going to talk about that? Yeah, no, no, that's fine. No, that's a great question. It can be AT and T to anybody. Okay, so we we can only guarantee that your device is going to work. We can't guarantee who you're calling if they're not on FirstNet that it will work. Uh, but we know that your call, your data, your text is going to get out. 
it's going to go out someplace. Yeah. <laughs> so hopefully the idea is, is that everybody is going to get on the network together and you know that your secured information at that point for a disaster type situation, if it's a call, text, or data that you're sending, is going to somebody else on FirstNet who has the same thing and it's going to go through. Now you talk about the priority. Excuse me. Yeah. I've got one more quick question. Yeah, priority, yeah. Can, can I identify somebody that's not on AT&T to, to be able to come in to, for me to receive? They have to have FirstNet for the priority and preemption to work. Okay. At this point, no other carrier offers priority and preemption. Okay. Well, they offer, I'm, I'm sorry, I misspoke. They offer priority, which again, priority gets you to the front of the line. But if there's network congestion, a lot of things that happen, you're still at the front of the line and not able to make a call out. Preemption is what allows you to make sure that other users are taken down off the network that are, that are non-essential personnel so that your traffic is going through. Sorry, go ahead, Chris. Yeah, thank you, Kyle. Um, so if I understand this right, and mind you, this may have changed since I last uh, heard, uh, my understanding is that the priority and preemption is on AT&T owned and operated sites today. Uh, that may not necessarily be the case with third-party agreement sites where you may be sharing space with other carriers. Is that still the case? Or, and if so, is there any notion as to when that may change so that the priority and preemption carries to the third-party sites that are basically kind of like roaming sites? Um, at this point, there, there isn't a change that's going to happen with, within those roaming sites, but the idea throughout the build-out is to build and replace in a lot of those areas with AT&T owned, well, they're t none of them are really technically owned sites, but AT&T ran sites that are, that are in that area uh, to discuss that. And then th that will allow priority and preemption on all of those sites and Additionally to that, most of those sites are going to have band 14 on them, which is obviously running public safety traffic completely separately. So that's calls and data. Yeah, Priority that's it. Yeah, that's important. Priority before was, was only calls, and, and this system allows data transfer, text, uh, you can you send video, you can send picture messages, whatever you need from a scene. I mean, think of it like it's a, you know, a scene of an accident or something like that, some type of event that's happened. If you need to be sending um, you know, data, video, uh, pictures, anything like that from the scene, all of that's going to go through uh, because you're preempting any other device around you. So our State Patrol has Panasonic arbitrators, and we can live stream. Yeah. Right now we're on the commercial network. Mm -hmm. So in, in theory, the SIM card that we put into the laptop in the trooper's car, which runs Panasonic Arbitrator, mm -hmm. it now has a AT&T FirstNet device getting all the priority and preemption. So when we have the camera live streaming, we're going to get priority and preemption on that phone number that that is listed in there. Or I can go into the portal and make that phone number, which is running the camera SIM card, always go without any interruption. Yes. So it's, it's going to do it anyway. The multiple priority levels is just going to allow you to adjust that if you want to. Okay. It's not something you, you have to do. I mean, it's something we recommend so that you can control whom has priority or not. If there's an officer that's not, you know, maybe involved in the, in the type of incident, you don't want their data maybe going over some of the others. But they are going to get preemption at all times, whether it's, it's live video okay. or whether they're just sending a text message. Is local number portability going to be available? Yes. Okay. What about the state's text to 911 program? Uh, will the PSAPs need any specialized equipment to traverse back and forth? Uh, that's, a, that's a great question. Uh, I'm not sure if they will need anything that's different. Um, the PSAPs have the ability to be a primary user with on FirstNet. So if they, they have cellular devices in that case, uh, th that will be priority and preemption just like any others. And I'll be talking about the user types here in a few That might be something, that be a question that the PSAPs are going to start uh, asking of you. What, what are yeah. they going to need on their end and what's it going to cost them and et cetera. Right. Yeah. Well, and so that's a landline, right? So if the PSAP sends it over the landline to a FirstNet device, is 
<laughs> is that how it works? <laughs> right. So obviously we can't control the landline portion of it. Right. Uh, we can only control the cellular portion of it. If it's a cellular device, they can. Uh, but maybe that's something else we should talk about entirely because PSAPs are a qualified primary user. So if they, if they have cellular devices that they need to, especially if it's in case of a backup situation, like I've had plenty of agencies before in the past that'll have wireless devices, cell phones in there so that they do have landline issues, landlines go down, something like that, and they have a first, first net device that's there that they can make calls, texts, et cetera on, uh, those will have priority and preemption. So if I'm on my arbitrators, or let's say I'm on the scene of the school and my video is running, but I also want to send pics back and forth to the sheriff or the dispatch center yep. of the perpetrator. It's going from AT&T's network into the PSAP, yep. guaranteed. Yes. Preemption priority. I don't have to worry about it not going because the system's busy. Exactly. Okay. And it's and it's to pre it's to prevent from that system that's being busy and from those command centers uh, to make sure that the that okay. traffic goes through and that it is priority. Happen? It's going to hit the landline, right? Yeah. It's got to hit the landline. It has some, to. At some point. The only, the only, the only reason why that would fail in my mind, and I don't, I apologize because I know nothing about landlines, is that if the landline is down and not working. Okay. <laughs> you can suggest those too. Yeah, we have, we do have to get that yeah. PSAP FirstNet understood so they, because they're going to wonder. Yeah. How do we use it? Right. Yep. Okay. Yeah, those are all, all great questions. Thank you. Okay, so new for this month are a couple of new devices. This is, this is fun for two reasons. Obviously, everybody likes shiny new equipment, new things. This is all good. But it's also, these are the first handheld devices that are on, uh, that are actually band 14 units, right? Um, so this is, this is two things. Uh, so, so obviously, the Samsung Galaxy S9, Samsung S9 Plus, Samsung providing devices for public safety that is on band 14 in my mind is huge. This is, this is a, a nationwide network that they know and understand that this is going to be up and running and is a big part of at and business going forward. So Samsung having band 14 devices that run uh, this type of equipment, this type of traffic for public safety is, is huge. Also, we have the new Sonom devices that will be on band 14 as well. Um, these are made with some of the larger buttons, so think of uh, a of fire, maybe EMS with, with gloves on, large oversized gloves, things like that, is able to assist with that. And uh, there are a lot more rugged devices, ultra rugged, not just rugged, ultra rugged. <laughs> so as we were talking about some of the uh, some of the user types earlier. So uh, again, this will be uh, uh, information that's refresher for some of you. So uh, primary users are police and fire, EMS and PSAP, and emergency management. They have priority on the network, and they are able to preempt other users at any point in time. The difference between that and extended primary users, extended primary users are a little bit different. They have priority on the network, but they're not preempting anybody off unless a primary user elevates them. So it's hospitals, utilities, transportation, and more. Uh, so if you look at some of the information recently, there's been a lot of questions about what type of agencies would be extended primary users, and we are listening to use cases for those. So we've added on uh, schools. We've added on a lot of other departments that would be assisting public safety. Um, if you think of, of any types of uh, information disaster that they could need, and those users can be elevated uh, within local control and within the new FirstNet core, as we were talking about earlier. We also have individual paid users. There are subscriber paid users that are actually could be most of the case uh, volunteer uh, uh, firefighters. They could be uh, EMS personnel. They could be anybody that's on a, maybe a stipend program within your departments. Um, part-time workers, anybody that uses a device for public safety today, they're able to still pay for their own service just like they do now, uh, but they're able to get onto the FirstNet network, get FirstNet pricing, and have that, those unlimited capabilities. What's your plan on to be able to, to monitor those users to make sure they're, they are who they say they are? And, you know, so if they leave, the, leave an agency, they're, they're still 
<clears throat> paying individually? What's their authority? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. We need your help with some of that. So the way that the process works today is if that user is, it works for your organization, you would give them permission to get a FirstNet device. This usually, 90% of the time will run through uh, an email address, but either way it has to be approved and registered by the, by, by the agency. It's a completely separate discount profile than your agency paid stuff, so you can, you can be rest assured you'll never get a bill for it, uh, but you are the ones that approve that, and then if they do leave the agency, again, we're not, we're not, <laughs> we're not gonna police those from here. Hopefully at that time you will then uh, delete them off of FirstNet. They will then have just a normal AT and T device, just like the rest of us. That was a good. So, so we have to have create or who's who's we need to do some type of governance structure. Any, anybody that you consider an ad admin within your your organization would approve those. Did did that answer your question? Okay. Um, so so those users are able to do that. They're able to. Uh, purchase equipment any way they want to as far as calling in through the website or stopping into an AT&T store as long as they have permission and they have that email uh, approval from you beforehand. Um, and so lastly, the, for, for the purchasing process, uh, you can contact, be in contact if you already have a local AT&T sales representative. Uh, we have the FirstNet Help Support Desk uh, that you can contact. If you don't have, uh, you know, normal uh, local AT and T, which most of you I, I believe have other carriers or anything like that, you're more than welcome to to contact me. I will I will assist you with any type of demo requests, pricing requests, getting an uh, account manager assigned to your account to make sure that we're taking care of that. And um, we have many different purchasing options for you to be able to choose from. Uh, with with the, our unlimited plans, it's very important to understand that we do not limit your data usage at all. Um, so we're not like any other carrier where it's limited at 22 gigs, 25 gigs. Your data usage is truly unlimited, and that's a part of our contractual uh, agreement with the it's First Responder Network Authority. Right. No throttling. And how does FirstNet pro can FirstNet prioritize between agencies? Say that again. I'm sorry. First net prioritized between agents. We can we cannot. It's all set up locally, to be be controlled locally. Um, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. We do. We have no control over it. At this point, we don't assume that we understand how your agencies would respond in a type of crisis. That's that's not our job. Our job is to make sure that all the equipment, the network works when you go to do it. Any other questions for me? Yes. We'll have the 99% coverage. So will that be available commercially too? So that if we, I don't have AT&T. So yeah. if I got an AT&T and then I'm retired, is my AT&T still going to have 99% coverage? That that's a non-first. Yeah, that's use? a that's a great question. So we're not we're not promising. That, that you will have 99% population coverage. Uh, with AT&T, that's only a first net promise. Mm -hmm. However, uh, AT&T is uh, an organization that still wants, wants to make money, right? So as we're building these band 14 sites and making sure that public safety has the traffic they want to, those will include all the other AT&T LTE bands as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you. Jim Lundstedt, do you, Jim Lundstedt, do you happen to be on the phone? Okay, Terry, you're up. Standards Working Group, Terry McClanahan. Good morning. Uh, Standards Working Group has not met since the last meeting, but we do have a meeting planned, an all-day event on the 27th of March uh, at DOT, and we have about 10 to 12 different uh, uh, standards that we're looking at at this point, and uh, we're going to try and pick up the pace on the amount that we're covering. Uh, as Chair Lampany mentioned before, on the regional and statewide groups, that's in minor draft form at this point, and that may be presented at this time as well. Uh, 
we just want to encourage everybody that if they can support us in any way with information that we need to, because it's a, it's a really good time to get together to figure out what, how we want this, everything to work and operate for the state of Iowa. Um, the web, website now shows all the different types of uh, standards that have been approved. And so if you ever need to see the standards as they are, they're on the website. So any questions? Good work. You got a lot of work to do. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> all right, we'll move on to old business. We have uh, under old business amend the former approved application from Chickasaw County EMA to Chickasaw 911 Service Board. Looks like a language change. Uh, Chair Buck. Yes, uh, that was a that was a mistake on my part. Thanks to Ethan for catching that. Um, dealing with Mr. Seeley in the emergency management environment on a daily basis. Um, when I saw his name, I just put emergency management. It's uh, on all the application materials. It is actually the Chickasaw County 911 Service Board. So I would make a motion to amend the approved application um, from Chickasaw County EMA to Chickasaw County 911 Service Board. We have a motion on the table for um, from Chair Buffington to um, former approved application from Chickasaw County EMA to Chickasaw 911 Service Board. Ness, second. Second by Dave. Ness, any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Aye. Okay, motion carries. New business, uh, Chair Buffington, you might as well just continue. Yes, uh, the the four um, applications listed there, the 10th District Reserve Law Enforcement, uh, Buena Vista County EMA, Iowa Department of Transportation, and the Jewel Fire Rescue um, have all been reviewed, approved by the user group committee, and recommended for approval. So I would make a motion to approve these four applicants for ISIX access. What levels are they, Andy? Currently level one. All of them? Correct. I'd like to second it since that's my department. That looks good to me. So we have a motion by uh, Chair Buffington and a second by Ellen uh, to approve these four uh, entities for the level one access to ISIX. Any further discussion? All right. Andy, uh, Chair Buffington, just to make sure, the DOT one, is that level four? Oh, I'm sorry, yes, DOT is, well, is DOT level four just for the fact that, you know, DOT isn't necessarily, I mean, they're part of the, you know, the build out. So, yes, I would, I'm, yeah, thank you for the correction. Iowa Department of Transportation would be level four since they own part of the system as well and are going to be using it operationally. So let's redo the motion then, if you would, please, to uh, you bet. level one. Level one for the 10th District Reserve Law Enforcement, Buena Vista County EMA, and Jewel Fire Rescue at level one, and Iowa Department of Transportation as a level four user. Okay, the motion, motion for that. Do you have a second? I second it. Second it, Ellen, again. Uh, any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Ethan, would you take a roll call on that? I don't know who dropped off today. Jeff Swearingen. Patrick Updike. Aye. Jeff Sunholm. I, I will uh, abstain from the vote on the Iowa DOT, but vote aye on the other three. Marty Smith? Aye. Tom Lampy? Aye. John Benson? Bob Von Wolfrat? Denise Pavlik? Aye. Sorry, aye. Bob is aye. All right. Denise Pavlik? Aye. Andy Buffington? Aye. Ellen Hagen? Aye. Deb Crable? Dave Ness? Aye. Jason Leonard? Aye. Rob Rotter? Aye. Mike Casper? Carol Lund Smith? Aye. Larry Smith? Aye. Linda Fredrickson? Aye. Sorry, Bob is aye. Kelly, Kelly Grossgirth? Aye. Motion passes. Okay, on the motion paper. passes. Thank yeah. you.
move on to public comment. If anybody would like to join the podium here for the address of the board, you're welcome to do that at this time. Okay. Motion for adjournment. Great. We're adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Adjourn. Fredrickson. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, it's, uh, oh. It's okay. Okay.